We are starting this next arc with a big bang. But what is the next arc exactly? Is it Elbaf or is it something entirely different? Because instead of going to Warland Elbaf, it seems like we've landed in Legoland in an entirely unexpected turn of events. And I have some thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts, but I also have a lot of questions. So help me as I try to work some things out. But first, help me work out why a whopping 62% of you are not subscribed to this channel. I really appreciate that you all watch my videos, but I would appreciate it even more if you would subscribe and you would make me really happy if you would like this video and then you would just make me ecstatic if you would also comment, turn on the notification bell, do all the things that make the YouTube gods happy. In all seriousness, please do help me get to 100k subscribers. It is September, and me reaching that mark will mean that I don't have to keep pausing our discussion so I have to keep making this plea. Okay, so chapter 1126. The Straw Hats have been separated on their way to Elbaf, which isn't super surprising, but at the same time, it sort of is. And what I mean by this is that it's not super surprising because this is a common new arc development. We often see Oda split up the crew at the beginning of a new arc, we've seen it happen numerous times, and it's a nice way to propel the story and to propel the plot forward, and it also allows us to find out more information about the very unique traits of what of a new island that we're at. You know, we saw this happen very recently at Egghead, for example. By splitting up the Straw Hats via the Eddy, this allowed us to have two camps to explore the new futuristic Egghead Island. It meant that we got introduced to a lot of the new futuristic technologies and also meant that we got to meet a lot of different characters in a much more efficient way. In the Wano arc before Egghead, again, the Straw Hats were very dispersed in this, you know, great country. And this meant that we had all sorts of different plots threads that we could follow. All of them, you know, culminating quite nicely, allowed us to understand the culture of Wano a bit better, the history of what's going on in the country. You know, we had things like Zoro's samurai adventure and his relationship with Yasui, as well as Robin and her time at Orochi's castle. All of this came together very nicely. And you know, there are so many more examples of when this separation of the Straw Hats happened at the beginning of an arc, but I think you get my point. All in all, even if it may be a bit predictable or formulaic, I think it does make for a richer introduction to the arc and allows for a fuller, more rounded experience when we reach a new island. So in that sense, the fact that basically half the crew have gone missing, the fact that they've been separated, that in itself isn't a surprise. We do have a very intriguing, a very surprising twist, and that has to do with how the group has been separated. Because longtime fans will immediately recognize that this is the other Buster crew that have gone missing. This is a very particular, very specific sort of grouping. And you can't help but think that this six, these six straw hats, the fact that they were chosen, that has to mean something. I think you could actually analyze this group in sort of a lot of ways. You could see it as the monster trio and the coward trio as being together. I've also seen someone point out that this is actually the youngest six within the crew that have been separated. And that's also quite an intriguing way to look at it, especially when you think about the Legoland. Maybe someone has chosen these six straw hats because they think that they're the closest in age and will get along the best. But I think the most obvious way to distinguish these six straw hats is that they are the original Arabasta crew. Well, it is the Arabasta crew minus Vivi because Vivi is technically a straw hat and that's actually a very important point because it sort of has me wondering whether this means that we're finally going to get Vivi's reunion with the straw hats. The fact that the Arabasta six have been taken and that Vivi is obviously very important to the final saga. She has been a constantly reappearing presence since the reverie but even more so in the recent Egghead Island arc. We also know that she's going to be of greater significance now that she is a confirmed member of the D-Clan. So look, my head is spinning. The cogs in my brain are turning. Fans have been long eagerly anticipating the reunion between the Straw Hats and Vivi. And now that we do have the Arabasta crew separated off on their own, I can't help but think that, you know, maybe this is finally that time. Although I do want to be clear in saying that I'm not suggesting that this means that Big News Morgans has kidnapped the crew, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that it's Vivi's voice that Nami woke up to. Because, you know, when you think about where Morgans and Vivi were last seen, the fact that Nami is surrounded by Lego, like, those details don't seem to match up. 
Although you could say that Nami's feathers, maybe that matches up with Big News Morgan's feathers, but I think that's getting a little curly and we're really getting stuck in the weeds there. Really, all I'm trying to say is that this would be a good opportunity for a reunion, but if we're just trying to bring things back as to what happened, why these members have been whisked away, and by whom, who stole them, who kidnapped them, we're gonna have to start thinking. We're gonna have to start some analysis. So what's really interesting is that here we are presented with some paradoxical facts. On one hand, the Elbafian warriors don't know where they are. It's almost as if the Straw Hats were taken away from them. The warrior giants, they feel ashamed that they've lost the Straw Hats. They feel like they can't face Elbaf without the full crew. So this seems to imply that whoever stole the Straw Hats away, they're not tied, they're not allied with the Elbafians. And that makes you start to wonder, does this mean the Straw Hats or, you know, this group within the Straw Hats, that the Sunny, they weren't taken to Elbaf? Maybe they were taken El Elsewhere, because obviously we have the Lego aesthetic in chapter 1126 as well, and that doesn't really look like Elbaf or what we've seen of Elbaf so far. So, you know, makes you start thinking, are we going on a detour? Are we going to another island instead of Elbaf? And that wouldn't be impossible, that wouldn't be unheard of, because we have seen that happen, you know, plenty of times in the past. For example, we thought we were going to go to Fishman Island after Ennis Lobby, but then we ended up in Thriller Bark instead, and, you know, we went on a whole ass trip before we actually made it to Fishman Island. Or even how we were prepared to go to Wano after the whole Dressrosa saga, and then we ended up with Whole Cake Island first instead. So as I said, it wouldn't be unheard of if we didn't actually get to Elba first. But then on the other hand, Nami's clothing, that certainly does look like traditional Elbafian clothing. And even the fact that she's surrounded by Legos, it was pointed out to me that Legos originate from Denmark in our real world. And given that Elbaf has its Viking inspirations, the Scandinavian roots, the fact that we have Legos in this scene, that still could be some sort of hint of a Scandinavian inspiration that is fueling Oda's depiction of Elbaf. So like I said, paradoxical details, and that makes this all the more baffling. You know, who from Elbaf have taken the Straw Hats but did so on the sly so that the giant warrior pirates don't know. A detail that makes it even more intriguing is the fact that they call Nami out by her name. Who knows Nami at Elbaf? I mean, it could have been potentially one of the other Straw Hats calling her, but that seems unlikely because then why would Oda shroud it in so much mystery? A character that I was thinking of that might fit all the boxes of knowing Nami, having some sort of connection to Elbaf, I was thinking of Lola, but then it would have to be a pretty loose connection because why would Lola be at Elbaf? I was thinking also of Capone Beige, similarly knows Nami, has loose connections to Elbaf, but very similar to Lola. Why would he be there at Elba? But I do very much like this idea that Nami is in a giant child's Legoland toy room, that the Lego are toys and it's fitting to her size because it's a toy set for a giant. You know, maybe it's even Prince Loki himself who likes to play with Legos and he's very childlike, even though he's 63. I guess in giant age, that's relatively young. Maybe that's why Lola chose not to marry him. I guess if it is Prince Loki waking Nami up, that could make sense because as the prince, he would have more intel. But the more I started thinking about who this could be and, you know, what is happening, I have to admit that things got even more left field up in my brain. I started thinking, you know, are we going to find out about Nami's past before Belmare? The fact that Oda has chosen to single out Nami in particular, especially when we we're all expecting Usopp to be the focus at Elbaf. It feels very similar to the treatment that Zoro got at the beginning of Wano, and we all know that we found out more about Zoro's lineage at Wano. So I can't help but wonder if the same thing is happening to Nami, although it seems a little unlikely just because we know that Belmare found her at Oikot Village back in East Blue. But look, nothing's ever impossible in One Piece. But you know, I might also just be getting way too deep into it. A more obvious connection, a more obvious detail to focus on would be the man marked by flames. Because we saw a mysterious silhouette at the end of chapter 1124 awaiting the straw hats to arrive at Egghead, suggesting that this person was impatient, eagerly waiting the straw hats, maybe so impatient that he decided to go out and take it upon himself to actually smuggle the straw hats. He couldn't wait. And even then, people were speculating that this silhouette was the man marked by flames, which would make more sense now that we know that the sunny just disappeared and what we know about the man marked by flames and his whirlpools. I've even considered whether this is just one big dream sequence and Nami is just hallucinating, especially hallucinating her 
Legoland surroundings because it is, it is very, you know, dreamlike. Especially because at the beginning of this chapter, we saw them all drink and the giants did say that Absinthe, the green fairy, that's so strong that it can cause hallucinations. But then that doesn't explain why the other straw hats who haven't gone missing and the Obafian giants, why they are sharing in this hallucination unless it is a shared hallucination because they all drank the same alcohol. But look, again, probably unlikely. I think that's a little bit more left field again. It is interesting to note that Luffy and Chopper weren't seen drinking, which means that they likely didn't pass out unless they were just drinking off screen or off page, but that seems very unlikely for their characters. So I wonder what they were up to when they all went missing. I wonder whether we're gonna get to see it from their perspective later down the line. I guess Luffy could have just fallen asleep because it is Luffy, but it is definitely food for thought. I have to say though, the drink itself, it's very impressive how strong this drink really is because it's affected Nami of all people. And we know that Nami can hold her own when it comes to drinking. We saw it firsthand at Whiskey Peak. So if it's strong enough to knock Nami out, that says a lot. Look, I don't know if Absinthe, this green fairy drink, is somehow related to the mystery of the Straw Hat's disappearance. I just think it does feel a bit like a Chekhov's gun. Why did they point it out at the beginning of the chapter? unless it's going to be important later on, but maybe it is going to be important, you know, much later down in the arc and not necessarily to do with the Straw Hat's disappearance. In any case, what I really like about this absinthe is this is exactly the sort of unique details, the unique features and the culture of new islands and new nations that I really like exploring. I said so in a recent video of mine when I predicted a lot of things about Elbaf. I really do like exploring the unique, the distinctive cultures of each new island that we get to. I just get a real kick out of these things. And something else that I said was I'm looking forward to the costumes, you know, the new outfits as per usual. I was quite right in expecting that we were going to get focus on the chestal area because it seems like Nami's boobs have been highlighted here, although it's not as revealing as I would have expected, but definitely a focus on the upper regions after the butt focus in Egghead. Something else that I said I was really looking forward to was the rivalry between Zoro and Sanji and it seems like we actually might get this in this arc especially now that they've been separated together from the rest of the Straw Hats. Whenever we get the Straw Hats being separated, they haven't been together. This is the first time in a while they have actually been separated together. And especially with this chapter also reminding us of the Dory and Broggy rivalry from Little Garden. I'm really hoping that that's serving us to also focus on the Zoro and Sanji shenanigans. You know what? I actually just love all the panels, especially at the beginning of the chapter that focused on the celebratory hangs and the shenanigans of all the straw hats. You guys know I live for this stuff. I really enjoyed seeing Lilith just seamlessly being integrated with the rest of the crew. That was very fun. I know it's a bit later down the line, but even the shenanigans of Robin's classic macabre, very dark humor. You know, when she's wondering whether her nakama was swallowed up by a fish. It's just so cute, super funny. It also means a lot because she's not very worried as she says this. And I think that says a lot about how much trust and how much faith she has in her friends because she knows that even in such a scenario, they really wouldn't be in that much trouble. The Kuma and Bonnie panels, they just melt my heart. I mentioned this after chapter 1125 as well. There was a little panel that seemed to play on this idea that Bonnie and Kuma are finally getting to travel together. They're finally achieving their dreams and Oda has decided to put this out explicitly in this chapter. These travels, the fact that they're witnessing the horizons together, that's exactly what both of them wanted more than anything else and really what got to me was seeing Bonnie in her child form and you know for the duration of the entire chapter. This really symbolizes that she feels safe enough now. She finally feels safe enough to be allowed to be a regular child again stripped of her pirate and her pirate captain status or her pirate captain persona. Because for as long as we've known her for the most part of the series since she's been introduced Bonnie has been in her adult form and we found out why she had to be in this adult form in the last arc. So the fact that, you know, this whole scene with her and Kuma smiling, Bonnie in her child form, that really demonstrates this sense of normalcy that we're finally witnessing for once for the father and child. Right now, this isn't Kuma the warlord. This isn't Kuma the revolutionary army. And this isn't Bonnie the pirate. And this isn't Bonnie the supernova. This is just 
a sweet moment between a father and his daughter. Another cute Bonnie moment that I really like in this chapter was this scene where she's holding on to Jinbei, worried that the rest of the crew have gone missing. I like to think that it's the fact that Jinbei was one of the first straw hats alongside Luffy and Chopper that Bonnie met when she got rescued by the crew at the beginning of the Egghead Island arc, plus the fact that she would know of Jinbei's reputation, of his status. I'm taking this to mean that Bonnie feels safest with Jinbei Hence, again, her being in her child form. And again, I think that's just super cute. And I feel like I say this after every chapter, but there's just something about these little details, about all the details in each panel that makes me feel like these panels are very much alive. They're very well thought out, and it just shows how much consideration, how much thought Oda puts into all of these very distinct character interactions. Speaking of character interactions, the big thing that we have to discuss is Shanks and Bato, that segment. Look, overall, everything about this interaction was just perfect. Very well done from all angles. I really appreciated Shanks staying cold and serious for this entire time he was interacting with Bato. He was maintaining the pirate face that he shows to the rest of the world, as opposed to to that cheerful, friendly side that we often see when Shanks is familiar with people. You know, the face he has when he's with Luffy or with Mihawk. I think a big character trait that everyone likes about Shanks is how chill he can be. The fact that he can just easily get over things over a drink like we saw when Mihawk came to his territory. You know, how he celebrated with Ace or even his civility and the respect that he showed to Whitebeard. You know, of course, before his request was turned down and then they had to do that sky-splitting duel. But overall, he has a very chill, very amicable personality. So seeing him deal with pirates, pirates that actually want to cause him harm or cause his friends harm, like we saw with Kid before or in this instance with Bartolomeo, this brings out a whole nother side of Shanks that we don't often get to see. And then of course he goes right back to his softer side when he's not actually with Bartolomeo, when Barto and his crew are out of sight. He's expressing joy at the fact that he's met someone who's so dedicated to Luffy. And that's exactly how I imagine him to have been feeling internally when that interaction with Barto was going down. But it's understandable that he had to keep a straight face when dealing with Barto because Shanks had a valid reason not to show mercy and he said so himself in this chapter. He can't let Bato's actions slide because he needs to protect those who rely on Shanks. Especially given his recent interaction with Kid, how close things got with Kid. Shanks saw using his future sight that if he didn't stop Kid back then, things could have turned disastrous for his friends. He knows what could happen when he lets his guard down, so that's why he needed to be so severe with Kid, that's why he needs to act this way with Bato now. Although I have no doubt that Bato isn't actually dead, I would even say the same with Kid. I think they're both very much alive, but something that really intrigued me in this segment was Hongo. Seeing how he's the doctor of the Redhead Pirates, I actually wonder whether we just saw a glimpse of his fighting style. I'm now thinking that he actually might be a poison man, or he might be someone who's able to create cures, who creates poisons, which is very fitting as a doctor. And perhaps later on, we might actually see a poison that causes this great pain and makes the victim's body erupt from blood, and we might see that on paper. And I have to say that Bato's response and his actions in response to being presented with this poison, that was equally perfect, equally well done. There was no hesitation on his part in choosing to end his life instead of betraying Luffy, and that's exactly what I would expect from Bato. He chose loyalty even when, in theory, he wouldn't have actually needed to follow through in poisoning Luffy, he could have just agreed to it and then just ran away. But I doubt that thought even crossed his mind. I don't think Bato could even bear the idea of being unloyal to Luffy, even if it is just in words. I mean, if he actually chose to poison Luffy, I'm pretty sure Shanks would have killed him. But this way, not only were the Bato Club pirates allowed to escape, or sort of, at least they weren't killed on the spot. But in Shanks' eyes, this cemented for him the idea of Luffy getting nearer and nearer to him, the fact that Luffy is achieving his promise of becoming a great pirate because he sees that Luffy has loyal followers who are willing to die for him, the greatest symbol of what kind of man Luffy has become. Especially because I'm sure it would have reminded Shanks of a similar situation, something that he witnessed when Luffy was so loyal to Shanks, to the point that Luffy chose 
chose to disregard his own safety and disregard his own life. We remember that young Luffy chose to defend Shanks' honor even when he was captured by Higuma, when he was being threatened by Higuma. And that's exactly what Shanks has just witnessed now with Bato doing the same for Luffy. I have to say, it is hilarious that the Red Hair Pirates are now making a habit of blowing up ships because I'm sure we're all familiar of the saying, don't meet your heroes. I think after this chapter, the saying should be changed to never meet your hero's hero. And I have to say, I am finding it very amusing to see all of these entertaining, dare I say, outlandish takes about Shanks. People saying that Shanks is a hypocrite, he's the killer of the new generation. Because the way that I'm choosing to interpret this, I think the Red Hair Pirates were showing mercy in their own way. The Bato Club Pirates were given a chance to survive. Yasop shot them and Shanks allowed Yasop to shoot them with the full knowledge, with the full belief that these followers of Luffy aren't that weak, that they will actually survive even if they're being blown up and even if the person doing the shooting is Yasop. And I think that's just what I really loved most about this segment. It's just a great reminder that this is the world of piracy. This is how brutal the world of pirates get. Just because he's Shanks doesn't mean that he's a good guy. That's something that was established in the very first chapter. And then at the same time, there are so many layers about what piracy and what being a pirate really means. There's this sense of a pirate code because there's this mutual understanding between Shanks and Bato. The mutual understanding that what Bato did can't be simply excused. The pirate's code when it comes to the honor and loyalty and friendship and look, just all of it. Brilliant. Especially because Bato is probably one of my top five characters in One Piece. Another one being Garp, whom we also got to see in this chapter, sort of. And look, hallelujah, it's been confirmed that Garp is alive, although I didn't doubt that for a second. But these new circumstances about Garp's survival and about his situation now, it does definitely raise more questions, especially about Kuzan's allegiance and his own plans. But this whole thing about Kuzan, about Garp, you know, Blackbeard's own master plan, the fact that they have Pudding now, they have Karibu now, the new reveal about Lafitte and his infiltration of the Marines HQ. There is so much to discuss here and it really does deserve its own proper discussion. So I'm going to get into it separately. Make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on that video because I this is something that I've been wanting to discuss for weeks, maybe even months. This idea of Blackbeard's master plan, that's something I've been tinkering with in my head for weeks on end now. And with every chapter, there's been new developments, so I've had to keep adding new details. But I think we're finally at that stage where we have to have that discussion. So like I said, watch out for it, make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it. But for now, there is something that I really want to focus on within this Blackbeard segment that I want to mention, and that is this panel that shows all all of Blackbeard's captains together, or almost all of Blackbeard's captains. This sort of mirrors the scene of the straw hats hanging out at the beginning of the chapter, but we're seeing it on the flip side with the antagonist, we're seeing it with Blackbeard's crew, and I also really think that this is a brilliant example of the unique paneling of the brilliant paneling that Oda often displays in his work. We see here in just one panel the unique quirks and traits of Blackbeard's crew. You know, we see Pizarro coming out of a wall or coming through a wall. We see San Juan Wolf peeping through a window. Again, I think it's just another case of a very well thought out panel. Really great composition work and I just wanted to show some appreciation to Oda. And look, on that note, I have to say chapter 1126 was a brilliant chapter. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. We got some of our goats and I can't wait to see where we're going to go from here. And thanks for listening to some of my ramblings on this chapter. And like I said, how many times have I said it? Make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on the Blackbeard video. Actually, you know what? Now that you're here, you can help me decide between these two thumbnails. Which one do you prefer? Which one is more clickable? You let me know in the comments below. I hope that's enough of a tease to get you intrigued. Let me know your thoughts on all of these developments. Thank you to these brilliant people who are Patreon and channel members. I appreciate you immensely and I shall see you all very, very soon. So this is Joy Girl and bye.